Welcome to the middle of the Kagan's Tower level of Blood Rain 2. Hope you've seen all the videos leading up to this point, or this entire thing is going to be completely incoherent to you. More so than usual. This is completely pointless. Chopping enemies like this just builds carnage, which we no longer need. Our character is max level. But, uh... We found Kagan's personal printing press. For, I guess, making propaganda. Make the vampires look good. Here in the world where they are in the process of exterminating all human life. So it's a tough sell at this point for his target audience. But they're gonna try anyway. Make the people literally bleeding them dry look decent and benevolent. Unless we put an end to this printing press. And of course, the only way to do that is to throw corpses into it. So here comes a potential corpse. I'm gonna try and use the shotgun trick. Successfully. I'm so glad I figured that out. The shotgun finally has a use. So late in the game when we got it so early. Can't grab her yet. Not until we do that. Now this section down, going completely berserk. One more to go. The hardest one, unfortunately. You'll note that uh, we gotta get something into the corner here, which requires at least two throws if we're lucky. And we got lucky. It ended up being three throws, but it could have been a lot worse. And they do high velocity spinning thing. Kills a bunch of random vampires again. It was cool the first time. Hopefully it's cool again. So when this lady gets up, we might be able to... Nope. She's too fast for me. I'm trying to grab her, of course. Because I've discovered that there are even more executions that I haven't showed off yet. It is approaching ridiculousness how long I have managed to not figure out how many animations there are in this game that I still need to show off. I'm not going to get this one, though. Bondage ladies are just too defensive. So she's out of the picture. We'll find another victim soon enough. Once this slowdown comes to an end, it indicated that a bunch more guys were spawning in. Oh, what a lucky day this is for me. I've been looking So here's one of them. I see you've been looking for me. Here we are. You want to dance? An alternate execution with the guns. There's also one from the back. Just gotta wait for this guy to reload again. Yeah, gotta take out the stick guys first. They're too annoying. God damn, you smell nice. Ah, got one. And there we go. The final one is just flipping over them and draining their faces, which is very similar to the default gun execution. But it is technically different. Which is the best kind of different. Uh, nothing up ahead. Besides progress, of course. But in the way of progress, inevitably stands Dampiers. Dampiers are the cause of and solution to all of humanity's problems. How many misquoted Simpsons references can I work into this video? Let's find out. 
First, we're gonna need a lot of HP, because we know Dampiers are a nightmare. But we can probably use our hammer on this one, at least. Let's try. It does not nothing. Surprisingly. That's good to know. And if we get any more blood donors... I suppose I will turn them into ammunition as well. The whole blood gun thing is one of those things I was very excited about when the game began. And as the game went on, I uh, now hate the blood guns. Because already, human blood was uh, split two ways. We now need to use it for both health and as uh, our rage refill depending on what execution we do. Now we also need to use it as ammunition. And there just is not enough blood in the game to fill three uh, different types of resources. And it takes too long. The only way to refill your health using human blood is to go through the entire feeding sequence, whereas execution speed it up. Damn, I'm a couple of quarts low. We should have enough rage to take her out. Depending on how defensive she feels like being. Because she can block every attack we have and take no damage from it. If our dodges work properly, we will get behind her, and she won't be able to block that. But they often do not work properly. Yeah, a lot of blocks going on there. Hardly any of this is getting through. So, we gotta feed again. Like I said, time is the hidden fourth resource, and it's the only one that is fully renewable at all times. There's always more time. Which is how this game has gotten its eight hour runtime, as was necessary to even get on the shelves back in 2004. Whether or not you had eight hours of gameplay didn't matter. This is very much a game that could have benefited from significant reductions in the overall amount of gameplay. Trim the fat. The level that introduced the Kestrels and the level with the big Kestrel boss fight, both of those should have been cut entirely. Those are the only two levels in the game that I could just outright bad. And uh, they're way too early in the game, so they sour your overall opinion. And they really wrecked the pacing. Without those levels, I would not have felt that the Wetworks was bad. I would have felt that it was lesser than many of the other levels, but... The fact that there are objectively bad levels in this game makes you realize that some of the other levels are more lacking than they ought to be. We did get a new ability there from killing the damp here. And... We get to test it out. Just gonna get a little extra rage. And then we'll play with Twice, or Curtain Twice Torn. Bit of a cumbersome name, more so than the animal names they've had for all the other abilities that we checked out last time. But, when we actually use it, Feeding time. it slices enemies in half vertically. We just got Helmbreaker. The signature Devil May Cry move, which Dante starts with. We now have, have access to that right near the end of the game. And it is a total game changer. Curtain Twice Torn is the first attack in the game that feels powerful. Look at that impact. One hit kill. It's excellent. It feels great. 
I love using it. We should have had this so much sooner, and we should have had other powers that were similarly, you know, strong at this point. But no, this is our first attack that actually deals worthy damage. It is worth the time to do the animation. And there is a fairly lengthy animation to it, so there's a bit of a risk-reward thing. It's well balanced in that way. It just feels good. I love Curtain Twice Thorn. It is a damn shame that we had to wait so long to get it, but now that we have it, we'll be twice torning quite a few curtains. And trying to keep the ammo up for our hammer. Which is a full-time job. Hammer takes up so much ammo. And here's Kagan's personal TV channel, I guess. He's really focused on propaganda, this guy. Nothing behind the green screen, which means there's probably a vampire room back here, maybe? Ah, I'm not seeing it. These guys like to just stand and shoot. Leaving them open to grinding negligible amounts of experience for our hammer. Yeah, I think I didn't get any experience whatsoever from that trio of rockets. I don't know what the deal with that is. Maybe you have to actually kill something in order to get ammo or uh, experience with the horribly implemented uh, ammo or gun experience system. Another huge burden on this game uh. that encourages you not to use the guns you like or the guns that are ideal for a situation, but the guns that you want to increase their level so that they might be useful at a later time. But they won't be because the upgrades don't really do much of anything. They improve the ammunition cap somewhat. And I believe that my control preferences have been reset again. It does look like these uh, guys are speaking German. So they probably are supposed to be World War One guys. The random minions are on my side for some reason. They're attacking the boss guys. I'm gonna real quick. Not that one. Oh, no, my uh, my stuff did save. This is the first video where when I loaded up the game and just started it, all of my preferred uh, options were already set. So I didn't have to reset everything. And I still don't trust it. I still think they might reset them again at random. But might want to wrap that finally, here in the last video, the game actually did work. Rage is still the solution to everything. Which is kind of, you know, comforting in a game that doesn't control so great. That's fine to have that fallback. The slowdown deaths were much better in the first game because enemies almost always exploded when they died. And the slowdown showed all their little bits flying everywhere. Very satisfying in this game, they just flop over. Probably could have afforded just to uh, cut those elaborate deaths for the sake of pacing. Pacing is a very fine art, especially in video games, because players are going to play at their own pace. That's one sub-level down. Time for the Sky Bridge. We've seen it before, there are two buildings connected with a little bridge in between them.
cut to the sky for no reason. For some reason, we want to get to the office below us. We can't just jump down onto the sky bridge. Because then we wouldn't be able to, I guess, break the glass and hop inside. So instead, we have to do something absurd. Or vision suggests that we attack these things. Which drops uh, gigantic metal marbles into the pool. Over here, honey. That's right, a pool with a grate over it. Over an office. Who the hell was the architect for this place? Did they want to drown all the vampires who are eventually going to work here? Did they sabotage Kagan? Is that what's going on here? Because if so, I approve. But uh, we need to do that sabotaging for him. That crafty architect. Don't even really need to get rid of these guys. I think I knocked his skull out or something. It despawned too quickly for me to see. <laughs> we'll say that I did. Because that's a cool idea. They did love their death animations. In general, the animations in this game are very good. Very, very indulgent, though. Almost all of them are way too long for an action game. Especially one that sort of expects you to have control over the character. The fights are balanced in such a way that you should be able to control the character. Unlike the first game, where the first game was all style. Control really did not matter very much. This one you actually do have to do fairly nuanced uh, movements and actions in order to get anywhere. Or you can sort of just brute force things and hope the AI is bad enough that it just screws up and lets you kill it. That often does happen. But you can't really rely on it. I feel like this animation is slightly faster than the one we've been doing where we stick the needles in their faces. So I'll probably do it more often. Anyway, you'll note that we knocked all the marbles into the pool. And nothing happened. So, what we're going to want to do is jump on the marbles and do our curtain twice torn. I don't know if this actually helps, but it feels like it helps. It feels like that's why we got that ability just a second ago. I love that the water, you can't see through it. It is fully opaque. It's like a pool of mercury below us. It is a very strange effect. I hope this works. If this doesn't work, and something else happened randomly in my practice run, then I don't know what we're gonna do, because I don't know what it was. Maybe we have to push the marbles into position, because they did not roll properly. We'll try that out in a second. We'll go into Blood Rage, so it doesn't drain our health as we do this. Send this marble where it ought to be. And hope that works. It worked. What a pain in the ass, the physics didn't work properly. So I had to do it manually. Technically, that was sort of a puzzle, though. Like a physics object puzzle, which we've never really seen in this game. Weird thing to implement this late in, but I figured it out. Eh, 
That should be good enough. Hop into the office. The cafeteria, even. You might have spotted him. Another one of these guys. Firing down from above. We'll wait for him to come to us. Here he comes. Trying to navigate the marbles. It is as difficult for him as it was for us. During the really half-picked up Raveler fight, you may have noticed that when we knocked out the pods for the Unraveler that eventually killed it, each one of those dropped, like, some organic blob. And those, uh, don't do anything. You can't move them or grab them with a harpoon. They just sort of exist. God knows why. Maybe they were planning something for the Unraveler fight that would have involved more interactivity with the boss itself so that we might have had a clean look at it. Hopefully we get the loading screen that has the unla uh, Unraveler's face in it because otherwise we're never going to get a clean look at it. Another guy with immediate rigor mortis. Out of our way. Just leaves more punks. Oh, look what happened to me. <laughs> what was that? Kilbert Godfrey's impression. Yeah, now what are you gonna do? You gonna bust out those knives? It's gonna be pretty hard when you're on your ass. How much more you think you can take? Ah! So, while they were doing their upgrades, they probably should have had us upgrade our blades. Because all of our attacks are terrible. And the hitboxes are weird. There's a lot of just lengthy animations, and you don't know when they are supposed to hit. Uh, so most of the time, they just don't hit. Unless you've got an enemy singled out, really pinned down. Might as well get a free top off. This was the cafeteria after all. See, these are actually good for pacing. They're, they're slow, but there's no threat whatsoever. They're like the only rooms of the game where there's no threat. So, you get a nice little breather. And you get a huge benefit from it. There's someone screwing around in the cafeteria. I'm not too worried about them. Then we go, like, three stories down. Don't have to fight anything. No gameplay involved. We just teleport to the Sky Bridge. Where we'll have another fight with another Dampier. And yeah, obviously we can easily break through the glass. Can we knock her off? That rules. She better die from this. From this slideshow of her falling into a <laughs> invisible floor. <laughs> Glorious. That is so much better than any Dampier fight we've had before. They all should have ended like that. Even ones that were above solid ground. And where do you think you're going? Dampier! I'm going to kill Kagan. I'm going to paint the fucking walls with him, actually. Afterwards, I'll settle with you. Yeah, I don't think that's how it's gonna happen. I've been wanting to kill him for 75 years. You only got the idea yesterday. That's tragic. But it's time to extract my inheritance. One pint at a time. You really want to inherit the world Kagan's created? Feral, that's like inheriting leprosy. Better than getting thrown out a 40-story window into sunlight, bitch. One down, one to go. Xerx, wow, is that you? You've been working out. Oh, this? Just something I prepared the Overlord to protect him from the lethal rays of the sun. I've been meaning to ask you about that. I thought your shroud blocks out the sun. No, it does. But the Vesper Shard taught us to harness the sun's lethal power and pierce the shroud. The Vesper Shard? 
That machine Kagan wanted at Brimstone. Overlord Kagan has many enemies. You're kind of his bitch, huh? So that's what brought down the choppers, and how you killed Farrell. And precisely how I'm going to dispose of you. It took me five long years to piece Father back together. I won't let you take him apart again. <sighs> Do you miss the sun? Hey! Stand still and I'll destroy you! Yeah, that's big talk for a little guy in an ugly suit. Why don't you come out here and say that? Thank you, no. I'm quite comfortable. Rain, I have no way to get to you or see you. What's happening? Eh, Zerks again. He's being a big bully in his dumb old people suit. It's like the ones I fought before, but it's enormous. Oh, and he's got a sun cannon. Any obvious weaknesses in the suit? Maybe. I guess those exposed spots might not be able to hold up to too much abuse. I can assure you that this encounter will be our last. Like you were reading my mind. Feral died in a cutscene. Twice. That's so great. And it, like, they did program animations and stuff for Feral. We saw them in her fake boss fight at the end of the Shroud Tower. So they could have made like a, a shitty generic Feral boss fight. They chose not to. That was an artistic choice. And I respect the hell out of it. Absolutely would not give us a satisfaction. What little satisfaction there is to be had from killing Feral. Because she's not a good character. It's as though they knew it. Sometimes this game surprises me with the knowledge of its own shortcomings. That's one thing I always love in media, is when uh, something expects you to underestimate it. And in doing so, uh, really changes your perception at some point. Because it is slightly better than you thought it was going to be, and they knew that would be enough to really impress you. It always works for me. Every single time a game or like a movie or something does that, it gets me. Blood Rain 1 did it, and Blood Rain 2 does it to a lesser extent, unfortunately. Hey, get over here, you stupid game here. Feral was a more interesting character than Xerx, though. Xerx is nothing. All the villains in this game are really, really underserved. But Xerx, he gets introduced near the end of the game. Technically, we saw him earlier in the game, but he had no character up to that point, and Rain hadn't met him, so from the character's perspective, he didn't really matter. And when we do meet him, he doesn't do anything. He has no motivation whatsoever. Literally, all he is is the only person who's actually loyal to Kagan. And we don't really know what Kagan wants besides what he already has, a world of vampires. So... what do we care about Xerx? Xerx is nothing. He's a slight extension to the character of Kagan, who is nothing. So nothing on nothing. And he gets to be in this gigantic people suit, as Rain calls it. This suggests that the other Meat Men we fought were also flesh mechs that had right, human guys. pilots inside them somewhere. Doesn't actually confirm it, but that may well be the case. Which should mean that it would be possible to enthrall them. But of course you cannot. That would almost make Enthrall useful, and they can't have that in this game. So two of the panels that were pointed out in the cutscene have turned green. <laughs> That's pretty funny, every time he kills his own guys. That stomp comes out way, way, way too quick. But anyway, two of the panels have turned green. 
We'll just yank them off. Like fingernails, they look like. Pretty gross. Good body horror. That's the sort of thing you like to see. The rest of this boss fight is exactly the sort of thing I don't like to see, though. This is a miserably designed fight. It seems like I'm screwing around and trying to, like, waste time so I have more commentary. That is absolutely not the case. There is really no way to do this any faster. Because if you get close to the boss, he does the stomp instantly, and you go flying. If you run in circles around the boss, he shoots that uh, rocket launcher, and you go flying. You do want to bait out the sun cannon, which ironically is his most useless attack. Also, his melee attacks are surprisingly ineffective. And you would expect them to be very ineffective, so... But the hitboxes on the melee attacks are accurate to the animations. Meaning that, uh... If you're too close to him, they will do literally nothing. But yeah, we're never safe. And we rely on ammunition for this entire fight. For our blood hammer, which has an ammo cap of three. Like the bad way to do the unraveler fight is the only way to do this fight. There is the gimmick of the panels. Thing is, you cannot aim at this boss. Every time you lock onto him, Aim, or Rain, shoots for a center of mass. That little, like, face sticking out in the middle. Which is clearly Kagan's face. It's not Zerk's in there. It was supposed to be Kagan. This is supposed to be the Kagan fight. Which is why it's so difficult. But story-wise, it's Zerk's. <sighs> then you get stuck on these poles around the side. Which are useless. As the boss shoots rockets around, it will break the upper platform, turn it into poles that you just get stuck to and have nowhere to go. But anyway, rain shoots for the cockpit. You don't get any benefit from shooting the cockpit. You want to shoot the, uh, the panels. But you do not get to choose your target. Rain decides for you. So, it is pure coincidence if you happen to hit the panels. When you get stuck in this animation and he shoots the sunbeam, guaranteed to drain a lot of your health. That should have been dead on for that second leg panel. But it's really hard to tell. Getting better at dodging the shockwaves. But not the rocket launcher. Yeah. Totally whiffed that, and now his melee attacks cannot hurt us while we're feeding. So, if at all possible, feed very, very close to him. So he can't hurt you. Okay, we got a second panel exposed. My health is dwindling rapidly. All that rage is good for here is ghost feeding. Because obviously our blades won't do anything to the boss. They barely do anything to minions. Let's get another panel off of this sucker. Because that actually does fairly significant damage as much as anything does significant damage here. This side is useless. Get this guy. Drain him. At least it didn't knock me out of the animation for once. Then I'm going to leap off the building. At the end of this cutscene, I will 
hop right back on top of the building with no loss of health. There's no punishment for leaping off the building and it puts you over here, which is where I want to be. Dragon's reservoirs are dry. Okay, we got all the panels exposed. And off the building again. This is a good spot over here though, because the pillars will prevent the boss from getting close to us. He will still try to shoot his rocket launcher sometimes, and it might sneak through the cracks in the pillars. My health is so bad right now. Yeesh. So you can get in here for a little bit of safety, but eventually you have to leave, and the boss will camp the exit. And the second I step foot outside, the boss is going to do a stomp shockwave. What you want is for the minions to run in here, and then you can drain them, get some refills, and then fight the boss. The minions have no AI, so they'll just get stuck on the pillars or run into the boss forever. The odds of them actually getting in here are really bad. The boss will knock them over on their way in. Okay, this guy might make it in. He's running against the wall. The entrance is over here, buddy. Come on, thank you. Hey, get over here, you stupid damn peer. And we get a tiny bit of health. Very little because he's been stopped by the boss multiple times. Anyway. Okay, we got him while he was stuck on a pillar. Then he knocked us off again. So let's see if we can find something specific around here. There it is. A vampire door in the middle of the boss fight. Very generous of them. Perhaps out of necessity. Maybe they even playtested this and realized the players would need a refill in the middle of the fight. Because I certainly do. I've never made it through this fight without using this vampire door. But we're near the end. This gives us a very high probability of making it through to the end. We got the ammo. That should not have hit me because I was definitely jumping when he did his shockwave. But oh well. Ugh, that's not the right target, Rain. So I wasted all my ammo there. What we gotta do is go back up that staircase onto the completely obliterated upper level. Jumping off the building gets us right to the staircase, fortunately. So we go up to the second level, and now we can grab the panels that we've exposed. You cannot grab them from the ground floor. Brilliant design. I don't understand you. We have created a vampire paradise. Why do you struggle against the inevitable? Guess I'm just wired that way. Anyway, I liked the world better before, when I didn't know you were in it. And that's the worst boss fight in the entire Blood Rain series, done with. It's a relatively cool looking boss, I'll grant. Visually impressive, for what that's worth. I did say last time that I was going to do uh, Spider's Daughter. There it is. Not worthy of the name. And a bunch of dead guys. Any secrets or bonuses around here? I kind of like that the Blood Rain series doesn't have collectibles. As much as I usually ding a game for not having bonus features and stuff like that. I do like looking for hidden stuff. This game gets by on simplicity. Barely skates by, but uh, I do love this series, despite its best efforts. Okay, these 
portraits are actually rather nice. Um, this looks like the Nosferatu guys, but he's clearly wearing a tuxedo. Not his weird military uniform. There's Ephemera, and a special portrait. This right here, this, uh, fucking The Scream parody, is the uh, Unraveler. This is what the Unraveler looks like. He's got a Jay Leno chin. Very, very silly design. We will get a better look at it elsewhere, because we missed the loading screen. Here's just a random lady vampire. She has a nice frame around the portrait. Also, the uh, the lights in the area are corpse-powered. And when you slash the corpse, it breaks apart a bit. See, he's got his leg. Then we slice half of it off. Glorious. Here we've got weird black and white people. Certainly didn't see those in the game. There's Slez. Kagan still has some affection for the old gal, even though we've dispatched her. This looks like Feral, but like a human form of Feral? Before she turned into a writhing mass of blinds and squiggles? Maybe she was once human. Uh, generic vampire dude. Actually, it looks like uh, Zarensky from the first level but in very fancy armor. He's probably been around for a couple hundred years, so maybe that was him at some point. A uh, random lady in a gown, looking very disheveled. Weird warrior dude. And then just a painting of no one in particular, but man, that's a really nice painting. The composition of it is actually gorgeous, and uh, the, the design of it, very unique and creepy. Giger-esque. Yeah, that's actually really, really well made. Maybe, like, it's because of the resolution, and if we actually got a look at the technique, it would be really shitty. But, uh, yeah, from an artistic perspective, the technique is very strong on there. Wish we could get a better look at it. Hey, get over here, you stupid More Zarensky. Uh, come on! Boom! Get up. Get up. That hurts. Yeah, it kind of stings, huh? These guys are doing a number on me, surprisingly. I'm gonna punch you in the throat when you're gagging. Looky I'm gonna here, kick your guys. teeth down your fucking All mouth. Of us here that guy here. really got a lot of threats in. As he was dying. Famous last words. They really did think these guys would be like mafia guys for some reason, though. I guess if you survive the apocalypse, you join the Vampire Mafia. Another black and white guy. Not at all in the theme of the game. More Zarensky. I guess he was the favorite son of Kagan. And we killed him. And this creepy samurai guy. That's all the portraits. But they were very nice. We got a tribute to Alas Poor Yurik, I believe. That might not be a skull, but yeah, it's just an orb. It should have been a skull. What do these vampires even know about being weird goths with their excessive amounts of money and world domination? Yeah. You again. You have caused me some trouble. More than I expected possible. I begin to wonder whether it was worth the effort to create you. Maybe you should have thought things through better before you wiped out my mother's family. Perhaps. We both know what's next, shall we? <laughs> the Vesper Shard made itself at home in my flesh. It has been unpleasant, but not entirely without benefit. It's not going to help you. What's the best you can accomplish? <sighs> That's enough talk, OK? I'm kind of trying to concentrate here. So we did manage to make Kagan's immortality miserable. 
or rather, Rain's mentor did, who we never met, but we did see him with his own intestines wrapped around his throat. The shroud cannot be revoked. The world is ours. In Eternium. You mean the world is yours, right? I find it hard to believe you'd share it. Ah, but that's a fault of your imagination. Do you believe I could have affected such global change myself? You've built me up beyond reason. There are many others like me. All over the earth. Each currently presiding over his own vampire kingdom. Though not for much longer. Let's see if you can hold on to it then. Very important plot details here in the middle of the fight. Honestly, I didn't even realize these were here. When I played through the level previously. So now we need to sandbag. The same thing I wasn't doing for the last fight. So we have this blood fountain, which works like the blood fountains in the uh, vampire rooms. They refill our health and rage. We just got to stand under them. They do not refill our ammo, unfortunately. But we can use health as ammo, which would be a good system in a game where the resources weren't all linked to the same source. And thus you could keep them and balance them as necessary. Oh, there's a uh, sunbeam lasers in here. Didn't realize that either. So I guess Kagan's done explaining what's going on with the entire rest of the world as we're on our little adventure. Didn't know these spikes were destructible. We've got monuments of gore. Very, very well designed. This whole area is visually gorgeous, I gotta say. But Kagan's done talking with his gravelly voice that makes my voice sound buttery smooth <laughs> by comparison. Kagan's got the same voice actor as Severin, by the way, so he's capable of sounding like, uh, you know, human, unlike me. <laughs> but uh, he is obviously putting on this extremely affected voice because otherwise he would just sound like Severin and it would be very distracting. And if you haven't placed it yet, it's Troy Baker, one of the more famous voice actors in the world. He's got a hell of a lot of animations with his fancy sword. They don't amount to dick. This boss fight is so easy. It is the same as every Dampier we fought. Oh, and he's kicking my ass. I'll just go uh, hop in the fountain for a second. Get my health back. Kagan can't do anything. All we gotta do is run around the center here. Looks like he gets his health back, though. So that's fair. You know, I never showed off Bloodstorm. I'm gonna regret it. But, uh, we gotta do that. Bloodstorm is this. Look at that, a storm of blood. And now my entire rage meter is entirely gone. Gotta waste a bunch of time getting that back. Even if you have like a bunch of minions around you and you do Bloodstorm, it might not even kill all of them. It is the least efficient use of your rage outside of Enthrall. The two final abilities we unlock are both absolutely miserable and should never be used. It should not have been in the game. Again, too much focus on things that just didn't need to be here. World was better without them. Very, very unfocused development. You can see it all over the place. Anyway, let's actually use our rage the way it was meant to be used the only way we've used it the entire game for Blood Fury. Oh, he's got a little ground laser. Look at that. He almost takes an entire rage meter to kill. This is for my mother. This is for my city. And this is for my angry little misspent life. You rat-sucking son of a bitch. Wow. 
You said it. Well, that's that. You're done. Kagan and the siblings are dead. How does it feel? It would feel a whole lot better if the world hadn't been sent to vampire hell. I was half expecting everything to return to normal when Kagan died. I guess that wasn't very realistic, was it? Guess not. There are still a number of people out there that desperately need help, though. And leadership. And here we are, in the throne room. I know you've never cared about them, but you are half human yourself. Maybe that half is enough. Yeah, maybe it is. Besides, I'm looking for work now, too. Empress might not be a bad job title. Until something better pops up. So, what's first on the agenda? We'll need to assemble a larger team. Then we need to sort out the vampires running loose in the city. It'll take some doing, but without leadership, they're not much worse than wild dogs. Besides, we control the sun gun. And that's right. And it's crucial that we do, because if Kagan was telling the truth at all, there are others like him out there, powerful vampire overlords. And once they learn of Kagan's demise, it won't take long for them to come to claim his property for themselves. They won't come alone, and they won't want to negotiate. What about Brimstone? Still no word? Nothing. But if Brimstone still exists, it's because they prepared for this. I wouldn't expect them to greet us with open arms. It's likely they've drawn definite lines, declared open war on everything even vaguely vampiric. Which includes the both of us. Stay down. Severin, these next few years are going to be very interesting. Eighteen years and counting since Rain said that. They have been interesting, I'll grant her that, but she hasn't been there to experience it. What a waste. You know what? We are actually going to save the game. Because it's completed. You gotta save it. I gotta save it at least to show off all the stuff we just unlocked. Even though it takes forever. I've had to do this so many times off screen. Look at how long it takes to save. I've rarely seen any game take this long. Much less a PS2 game. PS2 games usually aren't this bad. Uh, resume. Which of course, all that remains is the credits. Raymond Holmes, you should be ashamed. You should have told them to cut so much more stuff. For the sake of budget, and time, and making a better game. Not that the producer often cares about that, but... He would have accidentally made a better game if he'd done his job better. Obviously, so much passion. I've shown off a lot of it. And I will be showing off even more of it once we get through the credits. Just very, very unfocused passion. Throwing stuff in all the wrong directions, completely missing the stuff that is incredibly important. The whole gameplay mechanics are vastly improved over the first game. The first game was just either hold the melee button or hold the gun button and win every single combat encounter. But 
that was incredibly fun in its simplicity. I literally could not put the first game down. I loved it. I was like accidentally making two hour long videos just because I would get caught up in the game. And as soon as uh, it would get too repetitive and I would feel like putting it down, it would throw in some massive curveball and bring me right back in. This game was admittedly a chore. They made the mechanics so much better, which made the game worse because now you have to actually play it. You can't just hold a button and win. You have to uh, like do dodges to get behind your enemies, slash them with some semblance of timing, and manage your resources. Resource management has been a nightmare throughout the entire game. Just an endless balancing act that you never quite have enough to feel like you've balanced properly. Unless you take things very, very excruciatingly slowly, you are going to run out of everything. Which is probably the biggest problem with the gameplay. That and the fact that you get Helmbreaker all the way at the very end which should have been just one of many excellent attacks, but really it's the only good attack. Very unfortunate. Uh, a lot of the boss fights just stopped me dead in my tracks for a long time. It felt like a real grind to get through the game, and yet, both of these games are absolutely the exact sort of game that I really want to be playing from a stylistic standpoint. The first game was all about slaughtering Nazis, terrifying them, which is always in season. This game is about you live through the apocalypse and uh, you just keep going. Carry on with your goals regardless. Much more grim, but still very relevant message. And I like it a lot. Incredibly bold of them to have the apocalypse just about three quarters of the way through the game. And then you just have to live with it. <laughs> And then afterwards, Rain becomes queen of the world. And that actually is an incredibly interesting setup for the future of the series, which unfortunately didn't really come to fruition. It's a very obvious sequel hook, and there is no sequel besides Blood Rain Betrayal, which I said before is a betrayal. There uh, is no more 3D Blood Rain games. Betrayal is a 2D side-scroller made by WayForward, the um, Shantae people. So, like, they have incredible expertise in doing side-scrolling action platformer games that are really irresponsibly horny. So Blood Rain is an excellent choice for them. They almost always design very good games. And from what I understand, Betrayal is actually a good game even though it's not a Blood Rain game, because Blood Rain is a 3D series. Even still, I very well might check out Betrayal. I cannot do a live playthrough of it because it is notoriously difficult. So even if I practice the hell out of it, I would not be able to just sit down, talk over it, and play it at the same time. I'm not that good at video games. But I might do like a actually edited good Let's Play of it someday. No promises. But I'm definitely interested in finding out what the extension of the story is that they have in that game. Because they set up a lot of stuff. They set up an entire world of vampires in other countries to take out. Maybe like a world tour for Rain. And they set up the Brimstone Society as enemies of us, although the last saviors of humanity with their satanic imagery. Really putting themselves at a disadvantage by not using like crosses and stuff, which burn and repel vampires. No, they choose satanic images to save humanity. They're playing post-apocalypse on hard mode, their own Fallout 3 mod. Anyway, we unlocked a bunch of shit for beating the game. And uh, I'm not kidding, a bunch of shit. All of these outfits. I am going to have to go through and record little segments of me wearing each of them. I'll splice that in at the end. We have full level select, which is useful. Although many of the levels are like, or these sub-levels 
are like 45 minutes long with like six checkpoints in between them. So level select is not nearly as useful as it was in the first game. We have access to all the movies in the game, which this is not all the movies in the game. There were way more uh, pre-rendered CG movies throughout the game. And of course credits, but slideshows is the real interesting thing. Concept art. Tons and tons and tons of concept art. Let's check it out. T-posing monster designs. We never got to fight the gargoyles, unfortunately. Bit of a waste that they designed them. Look at them. That could have been a fight. But they're flying, so it might have been a nightmare. The Vesper Shard. They talked about it a lot at the end. They also talked about it a little bit in the beginning of the game, which is very easy to forget. The first level set up so much of the plot which was all forgotten by the time it actually became relevant. But the Vesper Shard was just a MacGuffin. It's weird that the MacGuffin was, like, discovered in the beginning of the game, and we never care about it. It's gone throughout the entire rest of the game. But it's what saved, uh... What's his name? Kagan's life. Made him immortal, even though his life is apparently agony for all eternity. So he would have had just a horrible time, whether or not we killed him. Hey, look, it's rain. And this kid, who does wear crosses. But not in the cutscene. In the cutscene, he had none of this stuff. Weird how much focus they gave that kid in the ending cutscene. Like the whole brimstone thing. Got a surprising amount of focus. Various Nazi Kagans... And undead Mortal Kombat Kagan. And Ephemera, why not? Throw her in there. She also has no eyes. There's the back of the <laughs> beasts. That's the sheer volume of junk in all of these uh, concept art galleries. So we're going to be here a while. You've seen all the plot there is to see, so this is all bonus stuff. You can tune out any time. Environmental stuff. They Look at this concept art. Absolutely beautiful stuff. They actually did the artist dirty in a lot of ways, rendering it in the game. Overall, though, the graphics of this game are really, really good. The animations are good, but they feel janky in the game. Mostly because the hitboxes are so awkward. You swing and it just... You don't know what's going to happen when you swing. Anyway, there's uh, the soldier at the end with his creepy smile. They designed it to be creepy, just like it was in the cutscene. All according to plan. It's not Uncanny Valley. It's intentional artist rendering. Make it gross and upsetting. As some kind of foreshadowing for the next game where maybe the Bramstone Society is evil? I don't know. City landscapes... And that's that one. We're getting into the environmental stuff. You will notice that uh, these concept art galleries are very poorly organized. So they, they managed to group these together, but a lot of times we're just going to get random images. Tossed together with no discernible order. Kestrels, who ruined the game. They should have just been cut entirely and replaced with Dampiers, but this is interesting. When we played uh, Nightmare Creatures 2, there was a considerable amount of dismemberment in that game, but when you dismembered someone, you would just see, like, the void. They would become transparent because they didn't design these things, little meat segments that are at the end of each limb, so that when you cut them off, you see that instead of uh, just the inside of the model, which of course is nothing. And they designed so many points where a person can be separated. Very impressive. A sort of thing that you can't skimp on, because you don't notice it when it's there, you certainly notice it when it's missing. So Blood Rain 2, better game than Nightmare Creatures 2. 
look at all this design that went into character models that we only saw in the first level. And only for like seconds at a time. Sheer untextured models. There's uh, their contingency plan for after the end of the world. They were going to eat these guys who are bred from Slez and uh, are just full of blood. You can apparently drain them for an extremely long period of time and then replace them somehow. It doesn't make any sense. Like magic would have to get involved at some point because you just can't eat the same blood over and over again. That's finite. But uh, they thought through something, at least. Like here you can see, at the end of each severed limb, there's just nothing you can see into the character model. Which is where those uh, cross-sections come into play. The corpse-powered lights. More Mortal Kombat Kagans. Should have been put back in the first group of concept arts. That gallery... And the uh, gross effigies throughout the boss fight in the throne room. Looks like the foreman used to have a very tiny hammer by comparison. I don't even remember seeing these guys. Yeah, apparently some guys were just walking around on the street and we didn't notice them. Nice corpse man. And a better look at this guy, because obviously, poorly organized, that should have been in the last gallery. Armies of T-posing, and these things. These, like, Shadow Man... flesh... uh... things. <laughs> I don't even know what to call them, but, uh, they weren't in the game. I don't remember seeing them. And I also don't remember seeing that skinned upside-down body. That might have been on top of Kagan's throne, but it looks like it's hanging from something. So yeah, I don't know what those are. Unused assets, probably. Our severely over-designed final uh, enemy type. We didn't get too good of a look at it, but the punk over on the left has uh, his ribcage, his chest musculature exposed. He ripped the skin off. Someone gave him a purple nurple and just didn't let go. Ripped the entire front of his chest off. The entire inside of Slez, which we saw again for 10 seconds. Horribly inefficient use of all of this technical ability. Really, really good effect in game, but they overdid it. And that's another one down. Kagan in bio armor. Like I said, this fight was supposed to be against Kagan, which is why it was effectively the final boss, and Kagan himself was nothing. Kagan had a lot of animations, but he was just so easy to beat. This thing was uh, very few animations, incredibly difficult to beat. And apparently it was supposed to have a toxic bio phlegm cannon. That would have been more interesting than just the rocket launcher. I think the rocket launcher was just our uh, blood hammer shots made much larger. Zerks, ridiculous character design. Uh, Mudvayne fan. There's our unraveler. Although in the final art, he has like a split chin. His lower jaw is in two different segments. But that is just what an under designed character. Like, visually over designed. But. No introduction beforehand, no explanation for what the hell it even is. You just rip its paws down and then it dies. But visually, really, really cool. Apparently it's a half-brother. One of Kagan's kids. Unsurprisingly, given the total mutations that happened throughout that family. Uh, turned vampire. Sure, why not? Uh... <laughs> Very snarky rain. Lockdown's first form. We're going to see the name of Lockdown a bunch. Apparently, Slez was originally called Lockdown. Or Lockdown would be... Hmm. If Slez is Lockdown's first form, then Lockdown 
should be a different character than Slez, who evolved from Slez, not the other way around. Weird. You could try to make sense of that on your own time, because I sure can't. Shadow Legions, they do have a name. Many, many different designs for realistic bondage piercings. You can get many of these piercings. You probably can't get most of these. It would at least not be a good idea to get leather stapled to your face over your mouth, like the guy in the bottom right. Lockdown turned vampire. Lockdown's minions. Like I said, Lockdown is supposed to be a character, but it's not. Guy with a flamethrower, we certainly didn't see that. Kestrels, my mortal foe. And Feral. Headless Rain. I like these guys who uh, put eat and food on their stomachs, just tattooed across it. Informing Rain of what to do when we meet them. Eat them because they're food. Brute is apparently the name for the uh, big guys with the horns on their faces. Oh, they actually called them bondage ninjas. Look at that. They said the thing. And we're halfway through the concept art. Many of these are not nearly as long as the early ones. And not as interesting as well. Just environmental stuff. If you want to become a level designer, this is the sort of stuff you want to study. Just seeing it visually dissected like this. I don't remember seeing this statue. It's fairly nice. Look at all the work they put into it, like a Lilith thing wrapped in a snake. Don't even remember seeing it. It may not have been in the game. Yeah, less to say about environmental stuff. It's very technical. Most of it is very impressive. A lot of detail. Broken down buildings and stuff. Again, done sort of dirty by the game itself. A lot of stuff just didn't end up looking as good as it ought to have. This probably should have been in the game. I don't remember seeing it, and I certainly would remember if I had seen it. Cuz gross. Statue of Kagan without hair, or with a very close cropped haircut. Not like his flat top. And that's the entirety of that one. We're getting near the end. Tower of what well, looks like flesh. Um, obviously it's not, but it reminds me of the Tower of Bodies from Eternal Darkness. Good look at Kagan's sword, which also appears to have Vesper Shard crystals in it. Maybe they used a few of the extras, shaved some off of Kagan's arm, tossed him in a sword for no reason. Purely aesthetic reasons. The bloody printing press. Extra, extra. And... Oh, that garbage truck was one of the better killing puzzles. Killing puzzles are such a good idea, and most of them work so well, and then the ones that don't are absolute nightmares. Bit unfortunate, that. Also, there were probably way too many of them in the game. Maybe one less per level. Suicide Bomber, guys. Also, the game gradually worked more and more poorly as you advanced through the levels. The first level worked great, and then as you went on, you would get, like, elevators that required a cutscene because they were secret loading elevators and shit like that. It got frustrating because they were padding things out and losing their ability to, uh, make things perform as good on a technical level. Don't remember seeing this statue of a guy getting his head impaled. Another good one. Even if it was in the game, it was underserved and worth a revisit here. Jesus, why not? 
And the suit of armor. We'll get a better look at that when we go through the costumes. Because Rain gets to wear a suit of armor. That's that one down. Uh, this hallway of corpses. I think we only saw this in a cutscene. There should have been a fight in this room. But no. That throne, very, very well designed. You can just imagine Jonathan Davis stepping out of one and then grabbing a mic. Don't remember seeing these pipes with their own bloody grabbers on them. Very gothic gory stuff. Total set design for a new metal band. I believe Jonathan Davis recently did a show sitting down the entire time while he was in recovery from COVID because basically all musicians have to go on tour now and all of them are getting COVID because it's not safe to tour yet. What a nightmare. It is very much like Blood Rain 2. <laughs> Hate to say it. Hate to see it. But again, I do love to play games where that's what's going on, especially games from 18 years ago, like I said. It's nice to feel seen by a video game. <laughs> and yeah, I feel Rain's uh, nonchalant snark at the whole thing. It's sort of like the whole uh, joke that people keep making about uh, Marvel movies these days, where like if they saw actual horrifying stuff, like if they personally witness someone committing a murder in front of them, they would just be like, that just happened, because that's the depth of their character. That's literally all they're capable of doing. And Rain is exactly the same way, but it works as part of her character. Like, her nonchalance at extreme nightmarish violence is part of her character. Her desensitization is characterization. And it works well. Because it's intentional. Here's the whole ephemera boss fight. Apparently there was a dome atop it that we didn't really get to see. We did sort of see it. You could see the blood red sky in the background throughout the boss fight, which was pretty cool. Just more environments. We saw all the good stuff. And that's the end of all those slideshows. Very, very cool. And it goes to show just how much they cared about this game and the sheer amount of work. I do appreciate it, even though the game itself is very unfun, if I'm being honest. But you didn't have to play it. So I hope you did enjoy watching it. I do like the game thematically. Now we're just going to go through all these outfits. That's right, all of them. Even though many of them are very, very similar. And do pay special attention, as I am going through these, to uh, the blades and the guns. Many of the different outfits have redesigned the blade and the gun as part of the costume so that it fits in with the theme. So again, excessive attention to detail. Please appreciate that. And thank you for watching Blood Rain 2. Again, hope you've enjoyed it. And that is certainly it for Rain's Adventures for now. What is that on my heel? Oh shit.